On this week's Problematic Women, we break down Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik being called trash by so-called feminists due to her role in the presidential impeachment hearings. After continued pressure from LGBT groups, Chick-fil-A pulls funding from Christian organizations, the all-female Charlie's Angels reboot flops at the box office, and Justice Kavanaugh accuser Christine Blasey Ford wins an award for courage from the ACLU. Later in the show, we have a special surprise. Our interns flip the script on us and ask us anything. Seriously, we have no idea what they have planned. And finally, we'll be crowning our Problematic Woman of the Week. Welcome to the show. I'm Lauren Evans, and co-hosting with me today is Virginia Allen. Welcome, Virginia. Thanks so much, Lauren. Each week on Problematic Women, we sort through the news to find stories that are of particular interest to conservative-leaning or problematic women, those whose views and opinions are often excluded by those on the so-called feminist left. If you are a problematic woman or just someone who supports strong, independent women, please consider supporting us by leaving a review or rating on iTunes and encouraging others to subscribe. It really does make a difference. Okay, well, this week there's just so much news going on that we want to cover, but we really don't have time to discuss it all. So we're going to kind of make a compromise and we're going to do rapid fire stories. So so just one after the other. Not as much commentary as we normally do, but we just really want to get you all the information. So Virginia, take it away. If you have tuned into the news at all this week, you might think that the only thing going on in the world right now are the impeachment hearings of President Donald Trump. One of the key players in these hearings has been Republican New York Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. The representative found herself in several verbal tips with Democratic Chairman Adam Schiff during the hearings. And footage of Representative Stefanik questioning former U.S.-Ukrainian ambassador Marie Yovanovitch has gone viral. Take a listen. The first time you personally became aware of Burisma was actually when you were being prepared by the Obama State Department for your Senate confirmation hearings. And this was in the form of practice questions and answers. This was your deposition. And you testified that in this particular practice Q&A with the Obama State Department, it wasn't just generally about Burisma and corruption. It was specifically about Hunter Biden and Burisma. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And the exact quote from your testimony, Ambassador, is, quote, the way the question was phrased in this model Q&A was, what can you tell us about Hunter Biden's, you know, being named to the board of Burisma? So for the millions of Americans watching, President Obama's own State Department was so concerned about potential conflicts of interest from Hunter Biden's role at Burisma that they raised it themselves while prepping this wonderful ambassador nominee before her confirmation. Representative Stefanik has received a great deal of backlash for her direct questioning of former Ambassador Yovanovitch and her verbal tiffs with Chairman Schiff. On Sunday, left-wing activist and model Chrissy Teigen called Representative Stefanik trash on Twitter. Chrissy Teigen is a self-declared feminist and devoted Democrat. She and her husband, John Legend, spoke at a policy retreat for House Democrats earlier this year. When asked what she would like to hear more women say more often, her response was, F you. As the drama of the impeachment hearing continues to unfold, we will be sure to keep you all in the know And if you're really not sure what impeachment even means, we encourage you to go back and listen to the October 3rd episode of Problematic Women, where we break it all down and give you all the information that you need. Christine Blasey Ford, the woman who accused now Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh of assault last year, won the Roger Baldwin Courage Award from the ACLU. Ford said, quote, when I came forward last September, I did not feel courageous. I was simply doing my duty as a citizen. While accepting the award at the annual Bill of Rights Dinner, take a listen. I did one thing. And when I came forward last September, I did not feel courageous. I was simply doing my duty as a citizen, providing information to the Senate that I believed would be relevant to the Supreme Court nomination process. This was one of Ford's few public appearances since the Kavanaugh hearings. I'm just waiting for the ACLU to give Justice Kavanaugh that same award for standing up and the courage that he had to kind of go through and put his family through these hearings as well. The Charlie's Angels remake opened in theaters on November 14th 
and bombed over the weekend, barely hitting 26 million worldwide. In comparison, Ford versus Ferrari opened the same day and raked in 53 million worldwide. Elizabeth Banks, the movie's writer, director, and actress, blames the film's failure at the box office on sexism. Even before its release, she said, Look, people have to buy tickets to this movie, too. This movie has to make money. If this movie doesn't make money, it reinforces a stereotype in Hollywood that men don't go see women do action movies. When it was pointed out that Wonder Woman grossed $821 million and Captain Marvel made $1.1 billion worldwide, Banks countered that they'll go and see comic book movies with Wonder Woman and Captain Marvel because that's a male genre. So even though those are movies about women, they put them in the context of feeding the larger comic book world. So it's all about, yes, you're watching a Wonder Woman movie, but you're setting up three other characters or we're setting up Justice League. Banks also defended the many remakes that have been staples in Hollywood recently. However, her statement again nodded to sexism. You've had 37 Spider-Man movies, and you're not complaining. I think women are allowed to have one or two action franchises every 17 years. I think what's really sexist is the fact that she's saying comic book movies is a male genre. It's true. I really enjoy <laughs> all those action movies, all the Marvel movies. It's always sexism. All right, next, The Salvation Army Pop singer Ellie Goulding almost backed out of the Dallas Cowboys Thanksgiving halftime show. The show kicks off the Salvation Army's annual Red Kettle. Fans expressed their disapproval of Goulding's backing an organization they said was, quote, anti-LGBTQ. On Goulding's Instagram post offering a glowing overview of the Salvation Army services, one fan wrote, quote, So sad to see Ellie supporting them. They're extremely homo slash transphobic, literally to the point of letting queer homeless people die. Goulding responded to the comment saying, quote, Upon researching this, I have reached out to the Salvation Army and said I would have no choice but to pull out unless they very quickly make a solid, committed pledge or donation to the LGBTQ community. Supporting an anti-LGBTQ charity is clearly not something I would ever intentionally do. The Salvation Army responded to the controversy saying, quote, We'd like to thank Ellie Goulding and her fans for shedding light on misconceptions and encouraging others to learn the truth about the Salvation Army's mission to serve all without discrimination. After speaking with Salvation Army representatives, Goulding has decided to sing After All. All right. And with that little bit of good news, let's take a quick break. You know, it's easy to get so overwhelmed by the 24-7 news cycle. It just never stops. So if you're looking for a way to keep up with all the news that matters, the Daily Signal podcast brings you the top news of the day. I co-host the Monday edition with my colleague Rob Bluey to bring you interviews with lawmakers, authors, and conservative activists. And we always start your week off right with a good news story. If you're a conservative who wants to be on top of the news, check out the Daily Signal podcast, available every weekday morning. The popular Christian fast food chain, Chick-fil-A, decided on Monday to stop donating to organizations that oppose same-sex marriage. These organizations include the Salvation Army, the Paul Anderson Youth Home, and the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Chick-fil-A says they will now focus its donations on education, homelessness, and hunger. The Salvation Army responded with a statement on Monday saying, We're saddened to learn that a corporate partner has felt it necessary to divert funding to other hunger, education, and homelessness organizations, areas in which the Salvation Army, as the largest social services provider in the world, is already fully committed. They continued saying, We serve more than 23 million individuals a year including those in the LGBTQ plus community. In fact, we believe we are the largest provider of poverty relief to the LGBTQ plus population. The Salvation Army closed their statement with an appeal to the general public saying, we urge the public to seek the truth before rushing to ill-informed judgment and greatly appreciate those partners and donors who ensure that anyone who needs our help feels safe and comfortable to come through our doors. All right. Lauren, do you think that Chick-fil-A pulling out and no longer donating to the Salvation Army and other similar organizations, do you think that's going to affect their sales? I mean, will people stop eating Chick-fil-A chicken because of this? I hope so. I really don't want to stop eating chicken nuggets and Chick-fil-A sauce. 
But that's the capitalist response, right? If an organization does something that you don't like, you vote with your dollars. And this is really disappointing to me because the left has everything. You know, they have Hollywood. Besides Kanye, they have the music industry. They have Taylor Swift. We have Chick-fil-A. It was like our one thing. And and now we don't. So it's it's just really disappointing. And it's kind of like a battle loss in the culture war where it seemed like Chick-fil-A was kind of the one organization that would stand up for their values and not kind of care what anyone else said. And it, it's not hateful. We talk about this every show. They just literally believe, well, and Chick-fil-A isn't even a person, but organizations and people surround like Chick-fil-A believes that marriage is between one woman and one man. There's nothing homophobic about that. You're not saying that we should treat these people lesser. The Salvation Army is very clear that they want to help these people get out of poverty and find homes. So yeah, it's just really frustrating that the one place that kind of seemed like it was a hope and a positive role model for other companies is now kind of cowtailed to the LGBTQ demands. Well, I think it's a little dangerous in some ways what Chick-fil-A has done because their primary fan base, I guess I'll say, besides people that love chicken, are more conservative leaning Christian families, those that believe in traditional values. And for them to, in a way, almost start ostracizing those people, I mean, those are their key people that are purchasing their products on a very, very regular basis. Yeah, I think it's definitely possible that we'll see a decline in their sales, which kind of takes you to this place of, wow, why on earth from just from a business model, even if you kind of remove the moral side of it, why on earth would they decide to do this? I don't know. Maybe they're hoping they can expand more in Europe if they adopt these policies. Maybe they're looking to get on college campuses, I guess is my only thought. But again, it's just really sad. Is that worth it? Losing your moral compass for donating to a charity that does good work and helps all people? I think we have seen a little bit of a change in Chick-fil-A ever since its founder, Truett Cathy, passed away. And now Dan Cathy, Truett's son, is the CEO of Chick-fil-A. And so far, for the most part, has really followed directly in his father's footsteps and upheld you know, the morals and the principles that his father kind of laid out for the company. But there's been a couple of times where I think we've kind of seen where Dan Cathy is a little bit more concerned with being politically correct and pleasing that audience. So I don't know, maybe maybe we're seeing a little bit of a shift in the organization. I hope not. Well, the, the people that I feel bad for in this story is, A, the Salvation Army, like, woof, what a week for them. First with this Ellie Goulding story and now with Chick-fil-A really kind of pushing them into the spotlight as being this like anti-LGBT group. And then the owner operators of Chick-fil-A who have nothing to do with this did not make this decision. And they're the people who are out in the community. And they're really the people who do the most good when it comes to Chick-fil-A. It sends a pretty negative message to have an organization like Chick-fil-A saying, we're not going to support the Salvation Army, which everyone knows the Salvation Army. You might not know in detail what they do, but you know that they help the poor. You know the guy ringing the bell. Exactly. The guy ringing the bell. <laughs> so uh, it's it's definitely disconcerting to see this kind of play out on such a large scale. Two organizations that, for all intents and purposes, have seemed very, very aligned morally to all of a sudden now be going head to head a little bit. So, Virginia, why do you think this is important? Do you think this is kind of one more domino to fall and this is just going to keep continuing to happen? Or do you think this is just kind of a random blip? You know, of course, I would love to say I think it's a random blip. But no, I, I think this is something that we really need to pay attention to as a culture, that when you do see these institutions, these organizations that have kind of been on the forefront of traditional values, when they start to falter, that's a really dangerous time in history. Uh, and it's something that we need to pay attention to. And we need to make our opinions known that, you know, it, it's not OK and that it is OK to have standards, to have moral standards. And even if those are not popular, that doesn't mean that they suddenly become less true. All right, Lauren, the most important question to ask, will Kanye West have to rewrite Closed on Sunday? I mean, th- it really does. It creates a market, maybe Popeye's, maybe Cracker Barrel, Closed on Sunday. You're my chicken and dumplings. But they're not closed on Sunday. It doesn't make any sense. 
<sighs> well, if you can think of a restaurant that's closed on Sunday that could replace Kanye West's closed on Sunday, Chick-fil-A song, please let us know. This is really the the issue pressing America right now. <laughs> Thank you for your insights, Lauren. (laughs) Always profound. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but stay tuned. Our interns are going to join us in studio, and they're going to ask us some questions that we have no idea what they are. So it's going to be really interesting. I'm a little nervous. Me too. All right, stay tuned. Do conversations about the Supreme Court leave you scratching your head? If you want to understand what's happening at the court, subscribe to SCOTUS 101, a Heritage Foundation podcast breaking down the cases, personalities, and gossip at the Supreme Court. All right, welcome back. We are joined by Kiana Stedman and Kara Brown, two interns here at the Heritage Foundation. But these ladies are not just any old interns at Heritage. They play a super critical role every week in making sure that problematic women is successful. They help us find a ton of the stories that we talk about on the show, the topics. They do write-ups, help us with the scripts. So they play a a critical role in making sure that Lauren and I are set up for success every week. We couldn't do it without them. And we decided this week that we wanted to have them on the show, but do something a little bit different. Lauren (laughs) and I have given them permission to ask us absolutely any question. So Kara and Kiana can ask us whatever they want. We have not seen these questions. We have no idea what they're going to ask. It's a little terrifying, but uh, we're just excited to have a good conversation. So I'm going to hand it over to Kara and Kiana. So I'm Kara Brown, and I'm the multimedia intern. And I'm Kiana Stenman, and I'm the general communications intern. The first question that we wanted to start off with is, this is a light one. So what is your favorite type of music that you like listening to? So I graduated high school in 2009, so I was 16 in 2006, and I never grew out of my emo face. I still love really whiny music. Um, I I branched out a little bit. I listen to a lot of Christian music, but I find kind of the intersection of the two. Uh, I also love country music. So pretty much any music that everybody else hates, I love. Really sad. But I also really love the Greatest Showman soundtrack, too. That's what what I love to rush So good. So. So good. Yeah, you can really sing along to those songs. Uh, so I have always loved a lot of just the great Christian music that we have today. I feel like Christian music has improved so much over the past 15 years. So things out of Bethel and United Pursuit, um, I love all that. And in college, I got really interested in sort of like folky, more chill music, I guess you could say indie. So I do kind of fall into that millennial <laughs> box with, you know, Mumford and Sons and John Rector and Josh Gerrels and all those people are great. And we're also still really into the Kanye album. Listen <laughs> <laughs> every day. Yeah. Okay. The next question we have for you, a little bit deeper, but what is something you have overcome that has really shaped how you view life? Just a tiny bit deeper. <laughs> Just, a Just a little. Just a little. All right. I'll go first. Um, so when I uh, was in second grade, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. And so school was super challenging for me. Uh, reading was really hard. And most most assignments in school that would take kids, you know, 20 minutes would take me 40 minutes. Everything was just harder and more challenging. Um, so from a really early age, I just kind of had to get used to the fact that everything would take me longer. And I would just have to kind of be OK with working harder to get to the same place as my peers. Um, and that was something that when you're a kid is super, super frustrating Looking back, I'm thankful for it because it really taught me from a young age the importance of hard work and just kind of like, all right, if I want to do well, I'm going to have to work hard. And eventually school did become easier and got into more of like a rhythm and a flow. But uh, it was definitely in those early years of really learning how to be how to be persistent and put my head down and get things done that that now I am thankful for. So when I moved up to D.C., it was supposed to be an internship for the summer, and it turned into a full-time job. So I started working in D.C. in 2012, had no family up here. I was making $30,000 a year, which for a city like this is – I ate hot dogs, and I, I worked overtime. And I just really, like, leaned into wanting to be here and really kind of working through those first couple of years. And that experience really made me – just understand how lucky I am to be here in the city and how 
that my story isn't unique and most people kind of start this way, that they have to really start from the bottom and, and have nothing. Um, and that just really, yeah, always grounds me if I have to stay late, if I have to work the weekends, it's like, no problem. I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to work hard to get where I need to be. Yeah, that's okay. awesome. Speaking of D.C., what is it like for you guys being conservative women in D.C.? Well, working at the Heritage Foundation is great. <laughs> <laughs> and I I will say I think we're we're quite privileged to be conservatives working at Heritage because, you know, so many young people who are conservative don't find themselves in a work environment where you're surrounded by people that have pretty similar viewpoints. But I'll say, yeah, being a conservative in D.C. can be interesting sometimes. You get interesting looks sometimes when you tell people where you work or people just kind of will end the conversation and won't care to continue chatting. But I feel like for the most part, people are quite civil. And my view on that is sort of like, well, you know, if if you can't at least put up with or stand where I work long enough to carry on a conversation, then we probably won't be good friends anyway. So that's OK. <laughs> well, D.C. is a really liberal place. So I've been here for seven years. I was here for Obama's second election and I was here for President Trump's election. And when Obama won, I was over by the White House and literally people were climbing trees. People were, were like, I don't know if you guys are know the term ghost riding, but that's where you ride your car really slow and you walk up next to it, like just dancing in the streets, publicly celebrating. And then I was over on U Street when President Trump won. And it was like you went to a funeral. Like people were just like so upset. This hipster man, he was sweating and really gross. He kept hugging me being like, oh, see, we're so tolerant. Like I was like, I understand. Just please get off of me. So it is really interesting, like Virginia mentioned, we're in such a kind of a bubble here at Heritage, and we work with so many great conservatives, but D.C. is such a liberal city. And I think sometimes it can be really jarring to go from one reality to the other. But I think, what, like what Virginia said, most people are pretty civil and, and like to talk politics and enjoy discussing politics. But it, it is difficult sometimes because you do have to watch what you say. We always do this dance when it's like, oh, who do you work for? Uh, it's like, I work for a think tank. Oh, what, what kind of think tank? A uh, conservative think tank. Oh, what conservative think tank? I work for the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not that I'm ashamed of it. It's just I don't want it to be a big blow up with whoever I'm talking to, not kind of in our little bubble, which is something that I, I need to work on because we talk on this program all the time to empower conservative women to kind of wear your conservatism on your sleeve and wear your beliefs. But at the same time, it's like, I, I don't want my Uber driver to start arguing with me when I tell him I work for Heritage. Well, thank you guys for that. We also want to ask, what is the best or worst piece of advice that you've ever been given? Oh, that's a good one. That is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I might have hinted before the interview that I wanted this question. <laughs> Disclaimer. So one of of the best pieces of advice I was ever given was by my sister. Shout out to my awesome sister, Sarah. She told me in college just to be really intentional with building friendships. And the way she said to do that was to consider, you know, if, if you find someone that you really connect with and you like and it's like, oh, I could see myself being good friends with this person to just be intentional about every week doing something with that person. So my first week at college, I met a young lady named Emily. We hit it off right away. But it's that sort of like, oh, it's the first week of college and I don't really know if we'll be friends. And, you know, you get really busy right away. And I decided, OK, every Tuesday we're going to get lunch. So I asked her, I was like, hey, are you OK with just putting it on the calendar that every Tuesday we're going to get lunch in the cafeteria? And she was like, sure. Um, and we did that for the first semester of college. Uh, and then after that, just kind of started hanging out, you know, regularly. Uh, and to this day, seven years later, we're still best friends. And I just think back to, wow, if I hadn't had have taken um, my sister's advice and I had not have had that kind of regular, consistent growing that friendship, I don't know if I would have been able to build that friendship to what it is today, which I am super, super thankful for. I feel like that's a very Enneagram too thing to say. <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> true. It's all about relationships. <laughs> yeah. Well, mine, based on my Enneagram 8, is actually kind of surprising, and that is to kind of own your own. I had a friend, Patty, when I was an intern, told me, you know, don't be sorry for things that you shouldn't be sorry for. I think as women, we always send emails like, oh my God, I'm so sorry to bug you. Or can you please, please do this? And it's like, no, if you're in a professional setting and it's somebody's job responsibility, you don't tell people to do something when 
you're not supposed to tell them, but you just have conversations and you don't have to apologize for just doing what you're supposed to do. And so just kind of own your own and, and be professional no matter what level you're at. But don't don't let that stuff get to your head at the same time. Um, I will also say, too, I, I just went to L.I.'s 40th anniversary, which was combined with Morton Black. L.I. is the Leadership Institute, and it was combined with their president, Morton Blackwell's 80th birthday. He wrote this document called Rules of the Public Policy Process. If you are a young conservative looking to get into conservative politics, that's like a whole page of really great advice. I feel like I'm always name dropping those. I'm like, never give a bureaucrat the chance to say no, or you owe it to your philosophy to learn how to win. So there's just so many kind of great nuggets in there that I'd really recommend to look at that too. So a question we wanted to know and thought maybe the listeners would want to know as well is, is there a problematic man in your life? (laughs) (laughs) No. Do we have a cricket sound for this? Yeah, no. So this is a subject that I talk about super regularly with my friends. Lauren and I often find ourselves in conversations about this. But the D.C. dating scene is challenging. It really is. There's so many professionals that are just very, very focused on their careers and, quite frankly, really aren't interested uh, in pursuing women. And I think as well, just our generation, this is something that they struggle with uh, from talking with friends that live all over the country. Uh, Many of them are quite disappointed by the fact that just men aren't asking them out. So all that to say, right now, there is no problematic man in my life. (laughs) Hopefully one day. Yeah, there is actually more single women in D.C. than single men. So just based on kind of free market thinking, (laughs) we're outnumbered. But also, too, I think when you add kind of this... If you hold certain values, you know, for example, Virginia and I, these Christian values, it it kind of adds another layer of complication on top of this where you really have to get to know people before you can start dating them, which obviously you should do anyways. But there's so many kind of there's the term rhinos, but, you know, like Christian and name only people in D.C. that it's hard to really start talking to people until you can really know kind of their heart and know where they're at. And it just kind of makes this like sense of awkwardness on your first date where, you know, you can't be like, do you go to church every Sunday? But it's like, you know, mine always is like, do you have a Bible study group that you go to? So you're, you're just trying to figure out kind of where, where people are at. To kind of tag along to that question, um, you guys are both people I look up to. So I'm just wondering how you find like contentment and purpose during that season of singleness. Um. Not always super well. <laughs> it's definitely it's definitely a balance and a little bit of, I would say, an up and down. But yeah, I, I think for me, it's number one, realizing that the season that I am in a, as a single woman is incredibly unique. Uh, and I need to take advantage of the fact that, you know, on any weekend, I can pick up and go wherever I want. And I don't have to, you know check someone else's schedule or make sure that's okay. Right now I can, you know, choose to be investing my money anywhere that I, you know, want to or, uh, so it's, it's that amount of freedom that it's like, okay, this, this actually is really special. Let me be pursuing the things that I want to be pursuing right now. Maybe making sure that I'm continuing to grow as a person in my faith, but certainly there are, there are moments when, you know, you come home at night from a long day and it's like, wow, it'd be, it'd be nice to be coming home to someone But it's just kind of always going back to the, okay, but I am really blessed in what I have and the freedom that I have in this season. So let me enjoy it while I have it. And I think, too, it's kind of separating yourself. Your your identity is not in who you're dating or who you're married to and kind of understanding that. And I think it's something that's easy to forget and to to remind yourself that married people aren't necessarily happy just because they're married and people in long-term relationships aren't necessarily happy just because they're in a long-term relationship. And, you know, it's just always easier looking and seeing that the grass is greener on the other side. So I think it's really just like Virginia said, making sure that you're, you're understanding that this is a season in life, but also too, if, if it that season turns into your entire life, just finding your, your value and your worth in something else, than your, relational status and, and understanding too that there's not there's more than just maternal mothers there's there's spiritual mothers and there's people who can be you know role models and guides to other people so it's difficult and it's lonely and it's easy to forget and like 
I'll delete all the apps on my phone, dating apps on my phone, and then I'll re-download them, and then I'll delete them. But yeah, it's just taking time to for yourself and working hard and valuing your friendships. So you guys have mentioned your faith a couple times on and off in the podcast. How would you say that has affected your perspective as far as what you do for your job, your perspective in other areas as well? I love this question. (laughs) Do we have an hour? (laughs) We won't start preaching. Uh, Yeah. No, I mean, definitely for for me, my faith is the foundation off of everything that that I build on career-wise, relationship-wise, you know, when I'm facing a a decision in life of, you know, should I walk down this road or, or this road? That's always something that I take to the Lord in prayer. And so... My my faith is something that, you know, I, I grew up in a Christian home, but when I was 18, I was very much kind of faced with a situation where I had to decide, okay, is this something that I really want to do? Do I actually want to follow Jesus and, and live this life? And ultimately that answer was, yes, I definitely do. Uh, and that was really because I, I had seen his faithfulness and I had seen his hand in my own life and I had seen his character and his nature as, as a good father and a loving father and, and what he had done for me. So it's when you have kind of that personal relationship with the Lord, you can't separate it out into fractions of, well, the Lord gets to have this, but not this. It's it's always a process of continually, you know, surrendering your career to the Lord and surrendering your future to the Lord and your relationships to the Lord. So he gets incorporated into everything. And when he's not, he's really good about telling me, hey, <laughs> I want to be involved in that too. Um, and that's something that continually growing and learning and how to just live uh, really surrendered under under his leadership because that's the place where there's peace and there's joy. Yeah, for me, very similar with Virginia, that, that you understand grace and you understand love from God, that you just want to give it to other people and, and you want to show that love and that, that comfort, you know. And then also, too, that there's more to this, that we are called to work hard on earth and, and love one another. But if we make a mistake, it's fine. We've been shown grace and, and we have second opportunities and, and third chances. So it's just really important. And it, it's something that kind of going back to that DC discussion that I think a lot of people who don't work at Heritage don't have the luxury of talking about this kind of regularly. It's a kind of a, oh, are you a Christian kind of deal. So yeah, it, it's just, it's really important that we, we use this opportunity and and we use this kind of blessing that we have to work for a place at Heritage that that really embraces religious liberty and religious freedom and and wants people of all faiths to, to talk about what this means to them. I love that. Thank you so much. Another thing we were thinking the listeners and us would like to know is kind of what your path to Heritage was. So I had a very interesting path. I was, I've mentioned on the show, I was a member of the Young Democrats in my high school. And because I kind of totally revolted against my mother. And then I got to college and I was like, you know, the Democrats have like one or two good ideas, but then I don't really think I'm a Democrat. So I kind of really took time my freshman year to read a lot and kind of understand what I believe. And that led me to this group called Young Americans for Liberty. Interned there one summer and then I went back to school and I actually was just thought DC was going to be one summer, was going to intern for Universal, and that was going to turn into NBC, and I was going to move to New York and work in television. But I I don't know, it just really was on my heart to come back to DC at the end of that semester. And I did, and I loved it, and I made even better friends. So I, like I mentioned before, I ended up staying. I worked for Cato for a little bit, and then I went back to Young Americans for Liberty, where I worked for three and a half years. And at that job, I did literally everything. I did field organizing. I sent their emails. I planned events all over the country for them. And it was just this really great experience that even though it wasn't technically in my major, I learned how to use Google Docs, which I'm obsessed with. And I, I make a Google Doc for everything. Uh, I made a lot of really great connections. I learned how to cold call people and organize large groups of folks. And it was just God put me in the right place at the right time to really kind of learn organization and learn how to work hard and then move me to Heritage where I then got to use what my degree was in, in terms of video production and audio production. But then I also had kind of this subset of skills that really was able to elevate me and elevate the team that I worked on here at Heritage. So my route was 
a little bit more direct. (laughs) 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 But uh, after college, I graduated and I moved to South Africa for a year and worked with a small nonprofit over there doing ministry uh, and volunteer work. And then uh, after that, I moved back to America and like six weeks later, uh, moved to D.C. And I had gotten an internship with a really great small nonprofit and then a door opened to intern at Heritage. So I interned at Heritage and then from there applied for the job that I have now um, and was incredibly blessed to get that job. And it's been so fun being at Heritage because, I mean, obviously you're in this environment that so many amazing people and wonderful people, but then you're just given a lot of opportunity to kind of grow, to, to try new things. And uh, it's, it's just been a lot of fun. So what would you say is your most controversial opinion? And this doesn't have to be something serious if you don't want it to be. All right. So I'm not going to go serious at all on this. Boneless chicken wings are still chicken wings. (laughs) (laughs) I've had many long debates with friends over this. I do not like bones in my chicken. I want to just easily be able to bite into the chicken and eat the chicken. Boneless wings are still wings. <laughs> so even taking politics out of the equation, I really don't like Taylor Swift. I don't get her music. I think it's kind of annoying. I think they all kind of sound the same. Yeah, so I just never got the Taylor Swift craze from like not even the old Taylor not Swift. Not even the old Taylor Swift. <laughs> Really? Well, we've talked about Taylor Swift on this podcast so many times. Well, I'm afraid it's so controversial. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you, Kiana and Kara. Hold tight. We'll be right back with a surprise not even our interns know about. All right. Well, welcome back. We are so excited to announce our Problematic Women of the Week. Uh, Kiana and Kara have no idea about this. We actually had them write a Problematic Woman of the Week write up. Well, that's why this week we are so excited to announce that Kara and Kiana are our Problematic Women of the Week. Congratulations, you guys. Oh, thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to ask you guys, what was one thing that you guys learned through this process and through this internship working on Problematic Women? Okay, well, I think I would say, so I graduated with a degree in journalism, and I mostly only did, like, writing and, like, a little bit of video work. So, like, I, like, didn't even listen to a single podcast before starting this job, which is a little bit funny. Um, (laughs) But I actually really enjoy it a lot, and I really love writing the segments that we do for Problematic Women. And I always had this idea that, like, either, like, I would go into media or I would go into written journalism. And there was, like, no in-between, and I had to pick. And then if, like, I went down one path, like, you could never turn around (laughs) and go to the other path. But then there's this, like, little spot in between where I could write media things and then it kind of like connects the two together so more like just on a personal career path thing I realized that that was something that I could do and that was something that I really love and really enjoy doing because it has like the little journalism side but it also has this like media aspect too which is cool so that's awesome I'm a little bit opposite of Kara. I have always loved podcasts and like listening to them, <laughs> always. Um, so I was really excited to see kind of the ins and outs. But one thing I wasn't expecting to learn and love so much was just seeing all the different people you wrote stories about and the different problematic women, um, how they were standing up in their lives for things that matter to them. And it just has made me kind of reflect on my own values and what I want to stand for going forward. And so I think that has been really cool and really inspiring for me. What's one piece of advice that you have for women who are graduating college and either looking for internships or just getting started in the career field? I would say Like, go big and even more than you think, because you can usually do a lot more than you think you can. And just give yourself the grace to try things. And if you mess up, like, you learn something. And so it's totally worth it. So, yeah, just go big. I guess I would say take the time to listen, especially as someone that recently graduated. I know I, myself, and my other recent graduates can kind of come out with this impression of like, oh, I have a degree. Like, I know what I'm doing. Like, I know the answer to this. I studied it in college or whatever. But honestly, I think that it's it's like a very humbling experience by instead of starting by speaking, starting by listening. And then from that process, like you actually have something worth saying because you've kind of taken it all in. And then what you have to say actually has some value. So I don't know. I feel like that applies to my life, at least as a little recent graduate. That is very wise. That is very (laughs) wise. Uh, 
Kiana and Kara. We are so thankful for both of you all. Congratulations on being our incredible Problematic Women of the Week. Hey, thanks. Thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) All right, that's going to be it for this week's edition of Problematic Women. Due to the Thanksgiving holiday next week, we will have a very special Wednesday release of Problematic Women. You do not want to miss it. We will be interviewing one of our heroes, Heritage Digital Director Maria Sousa, on what it's like balancing a career and raising four kids, growing up as one of nine, her path to management at Heritage, and of course, talking turkey tips for hosting a large Thanksgiving dinner. I am so excited for this episode. You definitely don't want to miss it. A little uh, sneak peek into who Maria is. She is also an Enneagram type two, just like me. (laughs) All right. Well, before we leave, we always have to ask, conservatives need your support in the podcast world, and we would greatly appreciate if you could give us a five-star review on Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast. It really does make a huge difference and makes us more visible to women who might not hear us. All right. And have a great rest of your week. Problematic Women is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. It is a product of The Daily Signal produced by Kelsey Bowler, Lauren Evans, and Virginia Allen. Special thanks to our editor-in-chief, Katrina Trinko. We produce Problematic Women in remembrance of our dear friend and former co-host, Bree Page.